Hello. And welcome to Makers.dev episode 107. Chris, 107 could be interpreted as October 7th. Can you tell me the calendar that starts on October 7th? Nope. <laughs> Didn't think so. <laughs> That's why I asked. It's the uh, the Hebrew calendar. The Hebrew <gasps> calendar starts in 3761 BC on October 7th. And that just seems so random. But of course it's random. Our start date of January 1st in the year zero, translated to the Hebrew calendar, would probably feel just as arbitrary. They'd be like, January 1st. In our calendar, that's like in the middle of the month on a random day. So I thought that was cool. I have a second fun fact about the number 107. It is the ninth Emirip. Do you have any idea what Emirip, spelled E-M-I-R-P, uh, what that what that might mean? No. Uh, I'll give you a hint. 107 is a prime number. Oh, okay. And it's the fifth Emirip? It's the fifth Emirip. Prime, uh, if you recall, is spelled P-R-I-M-E. Oh, it's also prime backwards. It's also prime backwards. It's mm. the ninth number uh, sequentially that's prime both forwards and backwards. Can you tell me the first Emirip and it's not a single digit prime? Oh, I was going to say like two. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Three. Uh, I, I looked that up. Thirteen? Uh, Thirteen. That's right. Yeah. Thirteen and 31 are both prime numbers. So 13 is the first uh, Emirip. Uh, those are my two fun facts about the number 107. There you go. Uh, those are neat. There you go. Thank you. <laughs> I thought so too. There were a lot of unfun facts that I weeded through to find those two facts about the number 107. There's a lot of boring people born on October 7th. Uh, yeah, there's uh, found two two fun facts. How was your last fortnight? We haven't recorded in two weeks. Uh, what, what, what have you been up to? Yeah, um, uh, we had relatives visit. My wife's sister came, uh, her kid and husband, and uh, yeah, we had a good time. Showed them around, and. Uh, it was like their, I guess, midwinter break, which my kids don't have, but hers did. So yeah, that was fun. Um, and then we, let's see what else. Um, a lot of work. Um, I did my advanced linear algebra test. Uh, and I, I started a new Cal competition, which I can talk Ooh, about. So. Also exciting. Tell yeah. me about the new Cal competition. What are you, what are yeah, you working Yeah, so at? I was doing the NFL one. Uh, I figured that I could not beat the people in like in the gold range already. So I'm like 50th place, I think. So I just stopped working on that one. Um, instead, I started this new one, which is all about stable diffusion. Uh, stable diffusion is mm. the open source text to image uh, model, which is super cool. And you can create really, you know, high quality, neat looking images. And it's all open source. Um, this is going the opposite way. So they've generated 16,000 images with stable diffusion, and you have to predict the prompt that generated those images. Ah, cool. Okay. Yeah. And so uh, that's, that's... How on earth do you do that? <laughs> <laughs> Good question. That sounds really hard. <laughs> yeah. Um, there's one more wrinkle, which is you don't have to actually produce the natural language prompt. Uh, instead, it's an embedding of the prompt. We've talked about embeddings before. It's basically a set of numbers that represents text. Um, and that way, they can do math on it. So instead of, you know, like character distance or something, which would be yeah. super hard, um, it is basically how close you can get in this embedding space, which um, is kind of a standard way to <laughs> to measure text similarity. So That's cool. Yeah. Oh, you know what's extra, extra cool is like the, the embedding sounds like it's a shared language for robot brains. Mm. I imagine it looks something like, ah, the, the token for cat is activated, but it's not, it's not the word cat. It's, it's sort of like the concept of catness, which you could, you can translate that into English in a, in a variety of ways. Is that, is that roughly accurate for what an embedding would be? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it, it's, yeah, it's exactly, it's robot brain stuff because we don't program embeddings. We basically say, uh, you have in this case, 384 numbers to represent your sentences. Mm -hmm. And then we send it a bunch of data and it learns what those 384 numbers should mean. Cool. Uh, yeah. So that's embedding. And, and, and embedding would be different for every neural net or there's a standard embedding of which number corresponds to which symbol. Yeah, it's completely dependent on your architecture and your training data and how you train it. And so, yeah, okay. there's lots of different models which can produce embeddings, um, and they're all different. So, uh, yeah, this uses a particular one. Um, yeah, but it could have chosen any number of, you know, 
probably a thousand different <laughs> embeddings. Yeah. Gotcha. It'd be cool if there was one standard embedding, but I'm reminded of the XKCD comic of like, there's 12 <laughs> different standards. <laughs> we should have one standard that unites them all. And then there's just 13 different standards. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I was actually looking this up and there are people who are trying to go in that direction. They've created benchmarks for certain things. And it turns out different embeddings or so different architectures and training uh, are good and bad for different tasks. And so um, there's no single embedding that is good for all tasks, which is probably what you would need to make some standard. Uh, instead, it's uh, that they, you know, it's very dependent on how you train it. So, okay, that makes sense. I'm reminded also of, I, I think the way that stable diffusion was created and Dolly and all those sorts of things is by first going from images and descriptions of images to then going backwards and being able to generate an image from a description. So you're now going backwards on top of that? Uh, yeah, yeah, sort of. So the way the way it was uh, originally trained is it scanned the internet. There's something called the Lion 5B data set, which I think is 5 billion image uh, description pairs. Okay. And those are like, you know, it scrapes all of Wikipedia, pulls the alt tag for the image and the image. Now you have a description of an image um, and it runs those through a network, right? And then um, that basically creates these embeddings. And then you have another network set up that, yeah, you feed the embedding in and you, D Diffusion itself is interesting because um, there's different ways to generate images. We've talked about GANs before. What Diffusion is, is say you have an image and you add a little bit of noise to it. You should be able to train a network to take that noise away. And so that is diffusion. And so you, you add progressively more noise to an image and then predict the opposite direction. Mm -hmm. And the whole time you're feeding it the, the embedding of, this, of the text as well to sort of drive yeah. it in, in that direction. So when you're done with that, then you can just feed the text and pure noise and you can get out an image which would have, you know, had that description were it in the data set. Oh, okay, that's very interesting. I, I'd always wondered why Stable Diffusion and Dolly start with, I'd seen the animations where it's, it starts with static and then it, it mm -hmm. uh, uh, progressively becomes the image, becomes clear, but I hadn't realized that that was a product of the way it was trained, that if you take a known image and then put static on it, you, you, yeah, that, that yep. totally makes sense. Yeah, it's, it's basically too hard to go in one step. So like mm -hmm. the, the, you know, the, the, um, goal, I guess, would be to go in one step. You just feed it text description and an opposite image. But that's yeah. basically too hard right now for networks. Yeah. Um, maybe in the future, but yeah. Instead, it's much easier to just predict one step of one timestamp worth of noise. What a cool innovation. That's yeah. not at all obvious to me because if, if you gave me the problem, like we're trying to teach computers how to how to draw arbitrary images, I think I would have tried to, to use a more human technique of like, well, the way that humans do it is like a layer at a time. So draw the first layer, I guess. And if you're drawing a scene of a, of a beach, like you might start with a layer of just a blue sky. So <laughs> try to get it one step that way. I wouldn't have thought like, oh, just start with static and make it a little less staticky. Yeah. All of it at the same time. And, and that that's the, the easiest way to do it. That's wild. This sounds like an impossibly hard problem. How on earth are you going from the image to the, oh, you called it a mapping? The, it, the Embedding. Embedding. How, how are you going from the image to the embedding. What's I don't even so, know where you would start with that. Yeah, so there's about a thousand ways that you could do it. Um, when I first heard it, actually, you know, you have exactly the network that took the embedding and made an image, hmm. and so it should be possible to exactly go backwards. Um, but I realized very quickly that's given infinite training time or infinite hmm. inference time. Um, you are you are given instead nine hours to do sixteen thousand images, um, and so you can only spend like two seconds per image, uh, okay. which is not long enough to do to go backwards through a network, um, even though that's possible. Uh, instead, uh, there's lots and lots of different ways you can do it. Uh, probably about the simplest way is to use an off-the-shelf. There's There are off-the-shelf image-to-text tools. Hmm. Um, so you can just use an off-the-shelf image-to-text tool and then take that text and embed it, and that's your that's one of your answers. So hmm. some people have already done that. That, that did fairly well, but I don't, I don't think that's in the top. I mean, it could be, but the the public kernel isn't is maybe... 30th place or something like that. Um, another way is you skip text altogether and just try to go straight from image to the embedding. So you need a big old data set. Um, and here, this is interesting because you can create your own data set. Um, that's certainly possible. You can also use, there's a couple different huge data sets full of prompts and image pairs. So this is, you know, there's several million images generated by people and the prompts that they use to generate them as public data sets. Hmm. Uh, so you just use that and you input an image, 
put it through a big pre-trained model, and then you know try to make it match the embedding basically of the and that works that generated. like you on your computer can train a model to do that to take mm -hmm. and wow that's impressive okay yeah that's that um, seems like it would be really really difficult that's surprising to me that that's like that that seems as hard as it would be to do stable diffusion the first way and i think that took like a million dollars of training time <laughs> or something so most of the heavy lifting is done by the pre-trained model that you choose okay so these are the same models like that'll tell you whether an image is a dog or a cat yeah. But instead of saying dog or cat, you have 384 outputs and you train them against the, the embedding. So um, also, I didn't necessarily just say that this works well. Um, right now, the, the highest score you can get is a one. That's if the they're perfectly aligned, like you get the yeah. exact right answer. And right now, the highest score on the leaderboard is like 0.53. So there okay. is a lot of room for improvement. Um, I think most people are doing one of the two things that I talked about. I think the final winner will be something completely different. Um, and I am working on something completely different, uh, but that'll be a secret if, if it works. <laughs> oh, exciting. <laughs> can we uh, can we have a hint of what the secret um, is? It'll take a long time for me to get right because I've never programmed something this complicated before. I've never worked this complicated before. Wow, yeah. interesting. My, my interest is peaked. I'm excited to yeah. find it out what this technique is. Probably also means it's going to fail miserably, so we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's... That's uh, what innovation looks like, right? Most of the directions you try don't work, and then one of them succeeds spectacularly. I'm, I'm excited. Um, tell me about the linear algebra final you had. Any any surprises? How do you how do you feel like you did? Yeah, uh, not super much to tell. I think I think I did better than I thought I was going to um, because they wrote in the syllabus they were going to give us a practice test, and then they didn't want to, but since it was in the syllabus, they did anyway, and the test was quite similar to several of the problems on the practice test. And so that really, really helped. So okay. uh, the fact that I actually studied and did the practice test uh, actually really helped me. So that's great. Uh, we do not get a practice test for the second test. So that'll be harder, presumably. Um, I also don't have my grade yet, so I could have done poorly. But I think I did pretty well because most of the questions were similar to something we had already seen. So gotcha. yeah, St okay. studying works. That's cool. the... <laughs> <laughs> doing the work actually actually matters you know i'm reminded yeah. of uh in college i feel like i mostly skated through high school and i feel like i'm and you know i studied and i, I took ap tests and I, I would study for the ap tests and, and to the the reviews and things and then in college freshman year i feel like i was over prepared academically and so like my my bar for how much work I needed to put in, into classes was set really low, and then sophomore year it was kind of the same thing. There was there were one or two classes where like two days before the exam I had to start studying, and then junior year I took organic chemistry, and I was told by several people like, "Ooh, be careful for OCHEM because that'll that'll get you," and I was like, "Okay, let me make sure that I'm putting extra effort into OCHEM." And the first test was basically just a review of general chemistry, so I take the first test. And, you know, two days before, I'm like, all right, let's open the book and like see what's going on. This is all just trend cap. This is, this is nothing. Everyone else is stupid. They don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> I'm so much smarter than everyone else. And uh, take the first test without really studying or, or just doing my regular method and got like whatever, a 98. And I'm like, okay, let's, college is easy. This is fine. <laughs> and then the second test was all new OCHEM stuff. And I do my normal technique of like two days before I like pull out the book and I'm reading stuff. And I have no idea what's going on. <laughs> it's talking about like these, it's using words that I'm familiar with, but like in ways I'm not familiar with. And I I think in lecture before I had been doing this thing where like when I listen to things, I feel like I understand them much more until I'm tested on them. And then I realize I have no idea what's going on. So I bombed the second exam. I think I get like a, like a 43 and I just think, oh, no, <laughs> this is very bad. And uh, for the rest of the semester, I just claw my way back. And I think I got like a like a B minus in the class. But uh, yeah, it's. Uh, why did I start? Why did I start telling that story? Uh, so <laughs> you took a you took a linear algebra exam. Studying uh, works. Study. Yeah. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Studying works. So I, I, I learned the importance of studying. And it wasn't until like junior year of college that I feel like i had to like actually apply myself uh yeah studying works kids study it's that's good uh cool how are you feeling about the master's program overall i i felt great uh except for the first couple of weeks of this class where i was like i don't know if i can 
uh, get a B in this theory class. Um, mm. I've gotten all these so far. I don't know why I'm worried. Uh, the first few weeks of this class were particularly difficult, though. Um, mm. But I think it's exactly the opposite of your OCHEM experience. Basically, like the first few weeks were crazy difficult, and the last couple weeks I've sort of skated through. Mm. So, like, you get through a lot of hard stuff at the beginning to sort of get you caught up to where they need you to be, um, and then the next few concepts are actually pretty easy and i'm sort of scared about that because I, <laughs> <laughs> I don't i don't know if they're actually easy or if i'm just deluding myself um yeah so i feel much better now uh, getting through the and that's a few people on the like forums said that they said basically the first few weeks are the hardest because they're getting you into all these new concepts um then once you actually apply them it's actually more straightforward so okay yeah do you feel like it's useful do you feel like you're uh that having this background knowledge of how linear algebra is working do you feel like that's that's informing your ability to solve these calculus problems yeah what what it really does is it lets me read the papers and actually understand them so so much information when you are using uh it, you know new the newest ai stuff is reading papers and then using the models because like they give you the models but they're not very well documented the documentation is the paper mm -hmm. and so to understand the paper you can understand it without the math, but it definitely helps if you don't have to look up every third word, you know. So that, that's really what I'm doing this for. I'll never try to solve a linear system of equations with machine. Actually, that's not true. I did that for the GPS competition. I, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I will very rarely have to actually solve a system of linear equations with, uh, with matrix math. But um, just knowing all the different terminology helps a lot. Okay. That's, that's very cutting edge, being able to read papers. Like, I don't, I don't think I would ever be that far ahead the stuff that i'm doing oh i have an update on uh the ai clip suggestion stuff but like i'm i'm a consumer of the things that i assume academic people are making to be doing these amazing things and that's that's impressive that you'll be able to make things on that cutting edge you're you're able to ah and already are i guess like all the cago stuff you're doing you're you're not you're not like importing a library you're you're doing things at the level of writing the code that is touching the the core math and the core numbers that then is running on your raw gpu you're not just making api calls yeah yeah, yeah. and i am just importing libraries sort of but i'm also yeah doing the actual underlying stuff um and, and the whole reason is because like so other people will read the papers and make apis and you know six months later you know, academia, the latest will be in a thing that you can use with an API. Yeah. Um, that's great for building, you know, a business and doing like, um, you know, yeah, that's like great for what you're doing. Uh, but to win cow competitions, you can't do that. <laughs> you have yeah, to, yeah. because by the time it's that way, you know, some new model has come out and you have to be able to use yeah. that. So, um, yeah, it's just using, it's using the same technology, but for different reasons, um, yeah. which is why I need to understand it. It's cool that you're on the frontier of that and I got to wait six months to, <laughs> and also like be beholden to some other person to, to sure, be able yeah. to do this i can't just like run it on a gpu neat uh the nfl competition i think you've just tabled any updates on that yeah yeah i sort of said i just i i can't team up because the prize money is too big and people don't want to risk their prizes uh and i also couldn't i just i kept slipping and i couldn't get i couldn't get whatever secret the people at the top had and so at some point i cut my losses and then when this new competition came out i switched to that one so gotcha yeah. i talked about you when we were watching the uh super bowl and oh, yeah. i was like did you know there's trackers and all their helmets <laughs> my friend knows how to like take that data and do cool stuff with it um yeah that's a bummer but i think i think you knew that going into it that because it was such high prize money like that's that's not a competition that you have advantages in yeah I, I also couldn't to get gold it really takes either a long time so like for three months so like mm -hmm. this this uh competition the stable diffusion competition like i'm going to spend all three months on it mm -hmm. um or just a ton of time packed together which i couldn't do because i'm working and had my linear algebra test yeah, yeah. Uh, so yeah i only had a month of you know semi part-time like you know an hour or two a day and so you yeah. just can't get a gold with that I'm still impressed you got 50th place. Is 50th anything? Do you get silver or bronze? I got silver, yeah. Oh, fantastic. Okay. Yeah. Is it, is it, it it's hmm. official? Like it's ended? You, no, no, like, no. It, it, it okay. ends in a week, yeah. So I'm in 47th place, uh, okay. which is right on the cusp of <laughs> silver or bronze. I don't really care. Okay. Like, no, it, it doesn't matter anymore since I'm not going to get gold. Yeah. Gotcha. And there's no prizes for silver? No, no. Okay. Okay. All right. 
cool. Uh, yeah, doing the, the step of the fusion thing sounds like it'll be a a closer match. I assume there's no prize money for that. Oh, there is. Yeah, uh, oh, but there the is. top prize is uh, twelve grand instead of fifty grand. Okay, so okay. People are Attract more willing to the... team up. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Makes sense. I have five things I'd like to talk about. The first thing is I am in love with Remotion in a way that I haven't felt since falling in love with React initially. Remotion cool. as a library makes so much sense to me. And I, I've known about this like since it came out. And I don't know why it took me so long to come back around to rediscovering it. But and the, the more I'm unfolding, the more I'm just thinking, oh my gosh, this is, this is the library I would have made to make videos in React. The model of it just it fits so well. You just... You, you make a React component that, that takes in as a prop the frame of the video, and then you can also get all these attributes of like how long the video is and what the frames per second is. But the core thing you need to do is say, okay, I'm making a component. The component is uh, 1080 by, by 1920, and here is frame number 36 of 1000. And if you can render that frame as HTML, you can make a video. And then, of course, that's how you do animations. And if you want to do a custom font, you, you import the font like you do in HTML. It's just in, in CSS. And uh, there was a component I had to make. I had to remake because I had already made this with the FFmpeg workflow that fits text to a given box. So if you, if you know how big the box is, make the text as big as possible without overflowing the box. And I just did it with, it's just JavaScript. It's like, oh, it's so much nicer than with FFmpeg. There was all this crazy stuff I had to do to get, to get that working in FFmpeg. I had to like render a single frame of a video with the text and then measure how big that video mm. was and then do that. Iter and that's a really slow process. And this is just HTML and JavaScript. So it happens in milliseconds. It's, oh, it's it's wonderful. And then they have this whole library of uh, uh, Remotion Lambda, which is this whole infrastructure that I spent months building out on uh, Firebase to be able to say, here's the job as defined by this HTML file with the bundle JavaScript and uh, the, the file name that you want and uh, render it in the cloud with serverless architecture. And it does it on Lambda instead of Google Cloud. So I have to have like two different clouds that I'm operating now, but it just works. And it, it does this thing that I that I had wanted to do that I just didn't have the bandwidth to do of splitting up the job into N pieces. So it's rendering on a whole bunch of different serverless functions. And then videos render in constant time because you, you just say for every, for every Lambda function, like render whatever, 30 frames, and then all of you render 30 frames all at the same time. And then stitch that into a video. And then all of you send it back to the one master job. And then the one master job like stitches them all together into a video. And then that one uploads it. So rendering a, a one minute video takes about the same amount of time as rendering an hour long video. Um, which is just so cool. So yeah, I I love Remotion. It's, it's opening up this new room of potential of <laughs> like uh, uh, someone asked me, can I make the the text bold in the title or italic for the for the clips that you're rendering? And my answer was no, you can't <laughs> because that's too hard. Uh, like I don't know how to do that with FFmpeg. I'm, I'm rendering it like as a as a caption, and it, it's it's complicated. It's it's there's not a straightforward way to do it. But with Remotion, the answer is absolutely because it could just be markdown and i could just say in your title just just have it as markdown or maybe it's just a WYSIWYG editor and then I, and then i render it as html and then because it's html it, it, yes of course it'll be bold and italic and anything else you want emojis emojis just work emojis in ffmpeg were gonna be a nightmare i was looking into how to do that because i had a use case where i wanted to use an emoji and now they just work because it's just html chris it's just html and javascript <laughs> it's the world i've been living in for decades um so yeah, that's that's really exciting. Oh, I told a story a couple episodes ago about this experience I had looking at competitors' websites mm -hmm. and feeling kind of demoralized because I felt like they had a better video editor product than I had, and they did at the time. And I also had no roadmap of like how I was going to get there, and now I have that roadmap <laughs> because that roadmap is a remotion. Like that's going to let me leapfrog where they are in terms of quality of the video. I have all these ideas of like. I was scrolling through TikTok and YouTube shorts the other day and just noting the formats of the way that people do clips and every single one of them immediately I thought, oh, here's exactly how I would implement that as a template in the video clipper. So the, this this whole new field is now open and I, I, I'm roughly back at the place that I was uh, a couple weeks ago with FFmpeg, but now I'm here with Remotion 
uh, it took me like three weeks to re-implement what took me on FFmpeg months and months to to build. So I'm in a very exciting place technically. Like the, the I'm going to be able to make much better clips, and the the platform I have of being able to make clips is just a joy to work with. It's just it's just React components, and it's lovely. And yeah, I'm I'm very happy. <laughs> that's that's my main update. That's the main thing I, I wanted to tell you about. That's cool. That reminds me of I've had to make PDFs a few times uh, in my programming career, and it used to be extraordinarily difficult, mm. like because it was the same thing as FFmpeg. You had to like know how wide stuff was and actually like lay stuff out on the page and stuff. And uh, then there were a few different things that just go HTML to PDF, and that's super simple because you yes. just make a web page <laughs> and then just render it. And that's it. Yep. Um, and Print yeah, XML, I think, is the one of the ones that I've used. Yeah, for that. that's yeah. one of them. Yep. Yeah, and yeah, there's some rough edges like around page things and stuff. And I suspect that Remotion will have some rough edges where you know, um, but otherwise, that sounds great. Yeah, that sounds. Like it's back in your wheelhouse of things that are quick and easy to do. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. So that's cool. And that's not necessarily to say that the HTML way of doing things is better than better for the you. PDF way or, yeah. or the FFM bank. Yeah. It's much better for me because laying things out on a page is hard. There, you, it, you, it's all the same sort of problems of like bounding boxes and fonts and colors and uh, how you layer things and um, how you animate things. And all of these, well, PDFs aren't animated, but you, you get what I'm saying. All of these different platforms have figured out their own ways of doing it. But I've just spent so long in the HTML space that I know where all the rough edges are. I know where all the pitfalls are when I'm trying to like uh, uh, vertically and horizontally center some text. I have been through all of the developments <laughs> in, in CSS and HTML of like all the different weird hacky ways of being able to do that. And now I know the best solution that works the fastest is just, it's a flex box and you say justify uh, within Tailwind. Oh man, you say flex items dash center, justify dash center. Uh, it's taken me a while to memorize that string, but that's how you do it. <laughs> and like, there's a lot of work that went behind that I know that that's the way to, to center it. And there are some times where that doesn't work and some of those I know and some of those I don't know, but I'm, I'm still feeling it out. Versus the same sorts of problems are in PDFs and in FFmpeg. And I'm sure, you know, for, for some of them, it might even be much easier to, to horizontally and vertically center text. But I don't know those platforms well enough to know where those things are. So I, I, I was in a soupy mess uh, in FFmpeg and I feel so much more competent and capable back in this HTML space. I'd... For for better or worse, I'm a I'm an HTML guy. I I know how HTML works. I I know how all the flexbox stuff works and the 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 box model. And uh, I I know how to integrate that with JavaScript and hooks and React. And being being back in this place feels really good. Um, it feels like videos are are going to become trivially easy to make. And uh, yeah, I feel like I'm on the on the cusp of like a whole bunch of new exciting things to to be able to make. Cool, that's exciting. How are you feeling generally after your launch? You had your launch, got a couple customers. Yes. I've been heads down in this technical development, um, mm. racing towards having something that's useful for the... So I, I had three uh, new customers from that launch. Uh, two of them felt... Uh, they may be listening to the show. Uh, felt kind of like tire kickers, like didn't have a, an immediate need for it. And one of them absolutely has an immediate need and, and wants to use it with other clients. I've talked about this before on the show. Yeah. And so I'm racing for him like to, to be able to have a workflow to, to be able to run through it. And uh, I am, I've slipped on two deadlines that I uh, said that, like I said, I would have stuff done that uh, it's not done yet. I, I really want him to be able to export videos, like, like download them from the website in portrait format, which... I'll be able to finish that today with a bumper at the end of it, which mm -hmm. I'm going to finish by today or tomorrow. And I had initially wanted to finish that like on Friday of last week. And then I said, okay, well, uh, maybe Monday or Tuesday and it's now uh, Thursday. So I feel, uh, I feel a little disappointed that I wasn't able to get that done faster. And I still feel like, you know, even if I lose this customer, like I'm, I'm going after the thing that I feel like is a really good solution for this. Um, oh, and this actually rolls into the next thing I wanted to talk about. Like, cool. if I can show people at this conference I'm going to, I'll, here, here's the dream of what I want to be able to do. I'm, I'm talking to people at this conference, and I, I, I don't want to be pushing too hard on like, <laughs> I, I got to find every person who has this problem. But in a conversation, uh, and I'm, I'm going to be asking people about like their 
marketing strategy and what they're thinking about. And if the topic of clips comes up, I want to be able to say, oh, I'm, I'm making a thing to be able to make clips. I'd love to know more about that. Uh, in fact, I'd love to like make a clip for you. Uh, can you text me your YouTube channel? And then I want to set up an automated uh, uh, <laughs> Twilio number where when they text me their YouTube channel, I immediately text them back with a customized demo with me, the guy they're currently talking to, uh, in the like that I've just texted them back. <laughs> and then when they click on that, that's going to be itself a remotion video that has like a screenshot of their YouTube channel that walks them through like, here's how you make the clip. Um, and then they can actually go and see all their videos. And then they can actually go and click into a video. It's not going to work on mobile, which I think is why the the video is important. But once they get back to their computer, they, they click on the video, they uh, are able to highlight something, they're able to click download, and then immediately download their, cl their clip. And, uh, and uh, edit it like like change the template so if i and that's that's really close to be able to do that so i feel good about that um yeah that that's how i'm feeling overall all right cool um that sounds super neat but also a little complicated for a conference that's my initial mm. take on that i'll be very interested if you do that if it works or not uh, yeah <laughs> This is, this is an idea that uh, Sarah and I had over dinner one day, and I have fallen in love with it as like a magic trick. Yeah, that, like it just it feels really cool to me that I could say, "Oh, I I'd like to help you make some clips." Uh, text me, and then you know when when I get around to it, I'll I'd love to look at your YouTube channel, like set you up an account. And the idea that like they could just immediately get that back, and that it's a customized video, like <laughs> just it feels really cool to me. I also I, I have in my head like a method of how I'm going to do it with remotion videos, and you know taking the screenshot of the website and and all the other stuff. Um, I don't know. It just it feels cool. It, it sounds cool technically. My take is if it makes you slip at all on the deadline for this customer you already have, yes. uh, I I wouldn't do it. I would make this customer as happy as possible. That's a good take. Yeah, yeah, because at its core, like that thing's kind of gimmicky, and I want to have a thing that people can actually use. Yeah, yeah. So I, I haven't put any work towards this yet, and I agree with you that making this customer as happy as possible, like that's going to make this customer happy, and that's going to make future customers like him extremely happy. So, yeah, yeah, that's a that's a good take. Yeah. <laughs> Once, you may also, I mean. Um, like I would go to the first conference also and just see how it feels to be there and talking to people. Mm. Um, usually, like if I think about conferences I've been to, I don't know. Like people just don't have the time to digest what's going on. So that's like why I would push you to get contact information and not give them anything until later. I guess let them yeah. digest it for a little bit. I don't know. That's interesting. Yeah, it might actually be better to text them after the conference instead of right away because if I text them back right away. It's gonna get lost in all the conference yeah, craziness. But I text if I text them back like three days later, and then I could actually record a video, right? Maybe it's better if I yeah. don't do it as a magic trick, but just like, <laughs> yeah, okay, maybe I'll just go with the <laughs> like, <laughs> like doing it straight. Um, yeah, and then and then they could like send it to me on Twitter or or anything else, and then if I notice something's broken, like, a uh, yeah, huh? That's a something I hadn't considered. Like, what if I just do the thing that I was <laughs> wanting to do the magic trick of? Um, right. Yeah. That's going to be much less work on my part, too. Like, developing that out was going to be a whole thing of setting up the Twilio number and making the, the video that can be a template. And yeah. Okay. Okay. I might table that idea for this conference. Yeah, I also want to be open to, like, I don't know what this conference is going to be like. I don't even mm -hmm. know if that flow of asking people to text me their YouTube channel would work. I don't I don't know who the sorts of people are who are going to this conference. Um, I'm very used to going to like the technical micro coffee conference where people are like all nerdy engineers <laughs> uh, are just like me. Yeah, okay. Maybe it's better to just put myself in the moment and experience the conference and have a goal of like meeting new people and helping them and not, not wowing them with a cool trick <laughs> that they're not going to see as... Uh, <laughs> Very impressive, uh, necessarily. Okay, cool. Um, next thing I want to talk about, the third of one, two, three, four, five things. Um, I, with your help, I think I figured out how to find automatically interesting clips in a video. Nice. I reached out to a few of the different sites that you sent me of these different APIs that have are employing people who are on the cutting edge and then they, they uh, repackage it as a customer-facing API. 
And I messaged him and said, like, this is my problem. Can you help me with this? And Assembly was one of the ones who uh, messaged back right away and said, yes, I think we can help you with this. And I looked at their API, and it was things like uh, automatic chapter recognition, which I was like, well, that's, no, that's not what I want, because that's like a non-overlapping. This would be nice for making timestamps, but that, that's not really going to help me. And sentiment analysis, which I was like, okay, well, that's kind of interesting that you can tell me that the uh, areas of the video where there's either strong positive or negative emotion, but that's that's not what I want. Um, and important phrases and words, which I was like, maybe I could get something from that because I could see for the whole thing what the important words or phrases were. And then maybe I see like concentrations of high words or phrases, but I don't really know like when to cut it off or, or that that's still not quite what I want. And then on the call, they walked me through the exact same thing. But while the guy who was demoing was talking to me about it, I realized, oh, hold on. I can combine all three of these things mm. and overlap. And then I think that's my perfect clip. I think I can just say, okay, for every chapter, and the chapter has a title, so that could become the default title of the clip, look for overlapping high concentrations of high emotion from the sentiment analysis and a high concentration of words, and then fit that to a sentence, start it at the beginning of a sentence and end it at the, at the end of a sentence. And the title is the title of the chapter, and that's the clip. And I think that's going to do it. Cool. And I realized this like on the call. So I'm excited about that. I think that's, I, I th this is not something like there's, there's a lot of work to do until I get there, but I think I see a roadmap now for, uh, for how I can get that. And it's going to be some tuning of trying to figure out how to, uh, actually get that to work and how to actually get it to make good clips but i think that's i think that's a way to start and i for for the way that i'm positioning this product i don't know that i need to get perfect clips from ai i yeah. think i just need to get like reasonable suggestions and then i expect a human to go back through and tweak them and find more more interesting clips um what's your what's your take on that method yeah that sounds cool and approximately what i sort of expected like you would have to combine multiple things because yeah when i was looking at the solutions there's several text AI companies out now, and they all sort of do things that kind of would have helped, but nothing was exactly what you wanted. Um, mm. So yeah, I figured you'd have to do multiple things and combine it. Um, so that's cool, yeah. It's also the kind of thing, if you get something sort of working, if if the person who you were talking to is technical or if they can connect you with someone technical, it's the kind of thing that AI people like to nerd out about, which is, you know, like I have this problem and you have these tools and I sort of did it this way. What is better? And, mm. you know, or like, how can I improve this? Um, so they can probably help you do that as well. Okay. Yeah. The person I was talking to was non-technical. So after I take a shot at it, I might, I might reach back out to them and see if I can talk to someone else. Um, a, a slight wrinkle in this is that doing this through assembly would cost three dollars an hour of audio which is amazing that's mm -hmm. so cheap for for the thing that i'm getting and totally makes sense for uh like like it, it's producing way more value than three dollars uh doing this per hour and that starts to become a significant expense yeah that's much more than like storage or, or processing or rendering or anything. Rendering a clip uh, on Lambda with this new thing costs about two cents uh, per, I don't know, like minute long clip. And so that's just got me thinking like, if I have someone paying me $100 a month, they could, they, they theoretically could cost me $100. It's not, it would be like their first month though. It wouldn't be, it wouldn't be ongoing because who's going to make, what is that, 100 divided by three? Who's going to make 33 videos in a month? That's like a video every day. Well, um, if you were planning to import their like whole YouTube library. Right, right. Um, but I'm thinking my, my, like, do I, do I need to have a cap on the number of videos or do I have like an onboarding fee that's dependent on the number of videos you have? Or is this a higher tier that you get suggestions? And uh, I, I think for sure this is a good place to differentiate the, the $30 versus the $100 plans. Yeah. Um, but then even on the hundred dollar plans, do I need to, do I need to limit the automatic clip suggestions? Um, yeah. So my, my first that? thought was just $3 you said per hour of audio, right? Right. But you're doing the text transcription already, right? Right. Um, uh, my guess is like 90% of the cost is the text transcription of that. It's uh, a third of it is the, is the transcription. Oh, just a and third then, of it. And then two thirds are this extra layer of like the sentiment analysis and the chapter detection and, and all that. Interesting. So yeah, it's it's only it's only two dollars more per hour than I was already paying 
and I, I happen to already be using assembly AI for the, the transcription. Oh, um, okay. Although I didn't need to use that for the YouTube imports because I can just pull the, the YouTube uh, transcripts. Yeah. I wonder if, hmm. I wonder if there's a way, like if someone, the, the other thing is like someone might import like an audio book, you know, mm. like 10 hours of them reading an audio book or something. Yeah. Um, hmm. I wonder if there is a much, much cheaper way you could get plausible paragraphs and then run those paragraphs through your assembly pipeline, you know, mm. like a much cheaper way using just text to identify possibly, inter- you know, 10 possibly interesting longer clips mm. then run those through assembly. So instead of 10 hours, you run, you know, 10 minutes worth through. Yeah. If I can do a rough first pass, that's a good idea. And the assembly AI right now, the, the assembly AI API doesn't support just sending text. You have to send, have to send the whole them. audio file and then say when you're making the API request, like, hey, also charge me two dollars more per hour to include the sentiment analysis and, and all that that other stuff. Uh, see, there's see. no there's no additional charge for the extra features. So like it, it's just it's just like, do you want this extra layer of analysis or not? And then the the extra analysis includes the chapter detection and the sentiment analysis and then and the keywords and a few other things uh, that I'm I not going to use. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. And they quote have plans to do it with just text but that's not <laughs> that doesn't mean anything <laughs> if people are paying them without it then yeah why not yeah yeah interesting mm. i mean you could just do it and see like how much people actually upload stuff um, yeah. i don't know yeah that might that might get tricky but okay yeah. okay cool um what else oh i <laughs> so because because doing this i would need to like totally redo the transcription I had the thought like, oh, this is going to suck because for for YouTube videos that I've imported, I'm going to need to swap out the YouTube transcription. But a clip for me is defined as timestamps. So when I swap out the transcription, it's going to be the same, like it's the same words set at the same time. It's just like the the assembly transcription is just a little bit better. It has punctuation and it's a little bit nicer. Um, so the clip is going to stay the same. The only thing that's going to be lost is if a human has changed words in the transcription. So I, I could have a button that, that says like find, uh, automatically find uh, clips in this for me. And then I could pop up a warning that says, hey, just so you know, like the transcription is gonna change. It's probably gonna get better, but if you've made any changes to it, uh, you know, to words, those, those might be lost. Mm-hmm. And the clips will all stay the same. You won't have to redefine the clips. So that that felt really cool. I felt like a, <laughs> uh, my my architecture had my back in this moment. Like I, I had designed it uh, correctly. So right. uh, yeah, that felt cool. Cool. Um, talked about that. Talked about that. Okay, two more things I want to talk about. Uh, I have not edited the last episode we recorded, and I apologize. That was two weeks ago, and you told me that the switching didn't work, and uh, I've kicked that. Like every day, it feels like I, I haven't done it yet. Uh, I'd like to do that today. And one of the reasons I haven't done that is that Hogwarts Legacy is amazing. <laughs> I think I've logged like 21 hours on it so far. Last night, I just unlocked the Avada Kedavra spell. I can, I, can now, I can now cast the killing curse on people, which is kind of funny because almost all of the spells, almost all of the like offensive spells of the game, you can kill people with. That's the whole mechanic of the game. Mm. It's like you're going around killing these poachers and these evil goblins and uh oh man, it's so and you get to be at Hogwarts. You get to yeah, oh, it's so cool. <laughs> you can like be in the great hall and oh man, I'm uh, like it, it's a slightly different layout than than in some of the films, but I have this mental map now in my head of like, oh yeah, I I know how to go to the gamekeeper's hut where Hagrid will be in the future from Hogwarts, and like I know where the Slytherin common room is, and I've been to the room of requirement, and like, oh, I've walked from Hogwarts to Hogsmeade. <laughs> oh, it's it's so cool. Um, I'm I'm just loving it, and I've had some insights about business stuff, like onboarding in this sort of game is so good and so smooth, and they. They introduce it to you with this really gentle ramp that that makes it feel really rewarding. So I've found myself having all these ideas of how I can make onboarding in the video clicker, uh, the video clipper slicker by stealing some of these mechanics from Hogwarts Legacy. Um, just like the way it rewards you and the sound effects and the uh, it, it'll have like 
it, it, it introduces you so in a, at such a simple level, like the, the first part of the game that you're playing through, you just have a single spell that you can cast with the, the right trigger. And it starts you off even like how to walk around and how to look around, like use the two joysticks. And then slowly progresses you up from there to, you know, I'm, I'm in these fights now with a dozen people and I'm casting this whole complicated series of spells to like, ooh, if I if I levitate them and then freeze them and then send this fire spell at them, that that's like this extra damage. And then I can link that with this other thing where if multiple people are cursed, then the damage from one also tra- uh, transfers to the other one. Um, it, the, the game has the game has taught me in a very fun, rewarding way how to become an expert at this thing. And I think that's the uh, one of the core problems with software is how to how to teach someone a new superpower in a way that the whole journey feels rewarding and fun. So, uh, the, it's, it's not just been fun. I, I, uh, I've, I've learned some business things from, uh, Hogwarts legacy too. And, uh, I'd like to make my software more like Hogwarts legacy. <laughs> it's research. That's right. Exactly. It's a business um, expense. That's right. Mr. Rick, um, I, I promise. <laughs> If you want to go down a YouTube rabbit hole, uh, YouTube for GDC, which is Game Developers Conference, I think, something like that, okay. or Game Design Conference, something. Um, when I worked at Hidden Door a year and a half ago for a summer, like when I was a consultant there, um, they are at their core, a, they're an AI company, but they're a game company. Um, that's what they're doing is making a game. And so I learned all about how game designers think about game mechanics and stuff. And it's very, very interesting. And yeah, I think we could probably do more of that. Um, and GDC is... It, an awesome resource for there, there's talks from years and years of conferences all about that. I mean, about other things too, like how to design shadows and games and stuff. But you know, a lot of it is like game mechanic stuff and game, like how a game feels and all that stuff. And uh, yeah, so I think that's a really neat area that, you know, programmers can explore more of to uh, apply to software. So yeah. You do GDC. Out. Yeah. That's, that's something I'd like to dig more into. It, it seems like game developers have really cracked this problem of, how to make something feel rewarding and engaging and uh, have you skating along this this narrow path of uh, not being too hard because then it would feel demoralizing and not feeling too easy because then it would feel boring, but like right on that edge and, and staying right in that zone of, of of capability of what you can do. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I'll check them out. One, one of the other takeaways I had from this is um, uh, my feeling of motivation playing this game doing work like with a to-do list <laughs> but somehow i feel so much more motivated to do the do the arbitrary work in this game than i do like to do my own work um and part of that i think is like you always you always can see this menu of here are the things you can do and here's the reward if you can do it mm. and at every step of that oh you get a little tinier reward uh telling you that you're on the right path oh and then once you finish a task you get a bigger reward and it's modeling the same sort of thing i would do in real life like sometimes you start a task and you think it's going to be one thing but then it, it explodes in complexity and it's actually this other thing and, oh actually you, you have to go back to the castle and get get this thing and then you have to bring it back here before we can do the next step and you thought it was going to be that you could just handle it right here and that's the same sort of thing i have in work but something about the way that they've structured these these to-do lists basically is it just makes it so nice it's not it's not overwhelming it's not way too much all at once if you showed me the to-do list of like here's all of the things that you'll eventually do in this game i think i would feel overwhelmed but they Mm -hmm. just feed it to you a little bit at a time and even like layers of to-do lists of uh you know while you're going around the world you can capture magical beasts but that mechanic isn't introduced to you until like 10 hours of playing it um and it's just this extra little ah here's an extra thing you can do while you're doing everything else that also impacts you know you, you can use the materials from the magical beast you can you can use a thestral hair to uh weave it into your hat and then that's going to make your your fire damage uh 10 percent more um they they manage that so well and this game was you know it cost millions and millions of dollars and the people designing these to do lists i'm sure are professionals and doing this specifically for games so on the one hand i feel sort of demoralized of how could i possibly compete with this in my own life how can I make a to-do list that's going to be a semblance of, of the, the amount of engaging as this as this game is? But then on the flip side, my to-do lists actually matter. <laughs> like, like when I do those things, it's not just it's not just to entertain me. It's like I'm building a thing for other people to use, or I'm uh, making some software that's that's going to make me money. And I think that's the core advantage that uh, my to-do lists have over theirs. But I think there are things I can learn about building a to-do list for myself from this very fancy to-do list that uh, cost millions of dollars for uh, 
pro designers who I'm sure have gone to GDC multiple years in a row to, to make. So yeah, that, that was an interesting insight, making, yeah. making better to-do lists that feel more like, like a game. Yeah. Yeah, I totally get that. A couple big problems with real life are real life is like infinite. <laughs> and so, you know, mm -hmm. like there's where the game is extremely uh, limited, um, you know, even though it's a big game. Um, the other is like in the game, you know, if you do the thing, you'll get the reward mm -hmm. in life. That is not guaranteed at all. Yeah. yeah. Um, and also at life, you may just be working on your thing, hard at work on your to-do list, and then your dog pukes on the floor. And now you got to deal with this side quest. Yeah. That has no reward. <laughs> and uh, it's uh, just something that happens. Yep. So, yeah. Yeah, they, they really treat you with kid gloves in games. Like, yeah, you never get, you never get totally derailed. You never, like, lose everything. Uh, if you do fail, if you do fall off a cliff, you just get knocked back, mm -hmm. whatever, 30 seconds or it's, it's, it's very forgiving. Yeah. They, uh, they manage that. They manage that really well. I find myself cause I've, I've been playing this in the evenings for several days in a row now. I find myself like itching for that dopamine, which mm. I don't like. I'm going to have to like go on a detox after, after I beat this game. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. But yeah, lots of, lots of lessons to be learned about it uh there's one more thing i wanted to talk about just a quick update cool. on dude where's my bitcoin uh -huh. or dude where's my crypto i think we, we titled it crypto. Yeah. block fi one of the two companies where sarah and i had money is going through bankruptcy proceedings in a pretty orderly way and they have uh a, a claim agent or, or custodian agent i think they call it called kroll mm. Uh, which sounds like an evil name. Yeah. <laughs> I don't like that they're called Kroll. Is it a law okay, firm fine. or accountant firm um, or something? Uh, they deal with bankruptcy. I assume mm. it's, I assume accountants and lawyers work there. Yeah. Uh, very hard to get in contact with. I, I tried chatting with him and I tried calling him and uh, probably a million people trying to get in contact. Probably a million people trying to, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but I submitted a claim and right. what they're going to do is on the date when, when Black Five filed bankruptcy, uh, they are taking all the crypto that you had and saying, okay, here's what here's what that crypto was worth in USD at that date. And that's your claim amount. And then my understanding is they, through the bankruptcy, they, they collect all the claims, all the people who owe the money. And I don't really like that I had to submit a claim. I feel like that should have been done for me automatically. And that that was kind of unclear, like if I even needed to submit a claim. Um, so I wanted to call them just to say like, hey, did I do this right? Like, this is a lot of money. <laughs> can, I, can I please have my money back? But I think what they do is they, they collect all the claims and then they add all those up and say, okay, we have claims for $100 million and we have $50 million. So we'll pay all these people out proportionally for uh, everyone gets 50% of, of what their claims were. So I feel hopeful that I think at the beginning of this process, I thought I would just get nothing back. And now it's looking like I'll get something back, and I don't know, I don't know what that something will be, but uh, I feel hopeful. All right. Well, good luck. Yeah, those things always take forever, and who knows? So, but someday maybe I'll just get a random check. That'd be nice. Someday yeah. maybe I'll just get a random check, and I'd like to yeah. view that as that I'm getting a random check as opposed to like ah, this, they owe me this much, and I expect yeah. this like yeah, I'll uh, yeah, it'll it'll be it'll be nice to get to get something back. I think that's all I got. That's all I got too. Then I'll see you next week. Goodbye.